All right, guys, today we're going to talk about Boyle's Law and Charles' Law. So take out page 03, your Cornell notes. You're going to take notes on this video just like you would if I were in class today. All right, so Boyle's Law looks at the relationship between volume and pressure and only volume and pressure. So what that means is the temperature and the number of particles need to stay constant. They have to stay the same because we can only focus on volume and pressure changing for Boyle's Law. Um, so what you need to know about Boyle's Law is that volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. So as my volume goes up, my pressure goes down, or if my volume gets smaller, so that my size of the box gets smaller, my pressure is going to increase. Think about that in terms of the particles. If I have big volume like this first guy, this guy, my pressure is going to go down. So if I have lots of space for the particles, that means I am going to have to have my particles travel really far before they can con collide with the sides of the container. Versus a very, very small box, picture like a little bouncy ball inside a small Kleenex box, that's going to bounce all over the place, lots of collisions, high pressure. So what I would like you guys to do once you type these is go to this link. I'll attach it too, so you can just click right on it and I'll put it on Canvas if that's easier. And I want you to just skim through that article and pick one or two real world examples of Boyle's Law to put in your notes for where it says everyday example. We can also use a graph to show what Boyle's Law looks like. So on the x-axis, I have volume, and on the y, I have pressure. So you can insert a drawing into your notes. In the left-hand column, it says Boyle's Law graph. Um, insert drawing, I just use little arrows for the axes and then little text box to label. But what happens is as I go along, as my volume gets bigger because the x-axis increases, my pressure is going to decrease. So maybe my point, we got a high pressure to start. And then as my volume starts to get higher and higher and higher, my pressure is going to start to get lower and lower and lower. Let's make that a nicer point. So if I connect those guys, as volume goes up, my pressure, oops, can I erase that or undo it? Nice. There we go. My um, pressure is going to start to go down. That's what an inverse relationship or an indirect relationship graph looks like. All right, now we're going to do a practice problem for Boyle's Law. So I'm going to zoom in so I have a, whoa, a little more room. It says a sample of carbon dioxide occupies a volume of 3.5 liters. So I'm going to kind of color code so my volumes will be blue. Um, at 125 kPa, so I'm going to make my pressures, and I know kPa is a unit for pressure and the problem says pressure. I'm going to make my pressures green. What pressure, so that's going to be my question mark, would a gas exert if the volume is decreased to 2 liters? So they're telling me I got to do a little prediction first. My volume decreases, and I know it decreases because it goes from 3.5 to 2. So if volume decreases, what is pressure going to do based off Boyle's Law? Well, I know Boyle's Law has an inverse or an indirect relationship, so my pressure should go up if my volume goes down. So now I'm going to kind of list what they give me because word problems are not my forte. So let's see. It says we have a volume of 3.5 liters. So I'm going to put that in, 3.5 liters as my starting volume. And it has a 125 kPa pressure. We know that the volume is going to change to 2 liters. And then I put a question mark for pressure too, because that's what we're looking for. So here's how we set these problems up. I'm going to look for whoever does not have a date to the dance. So volumes 
pair up with volumes, pressures pair up with pressure. So I see that the volumes have a date, but pressure's date is a question mark right now. It doesn't know who's going to ask it to the dance. So I start with whoever doesn't have a date, 125 kPa, and we're going to multiply it kind of similar to the pressure conversions by a fraction. The difference this time is the fraction is going to come from the two who have a date. So imagine you don't have a date to the dance and your friends who are going to go as a couple, they're trying to tell pressure, oh, you should go with this guy. You should go with this guy. That's what they're going to do here. Well, we know we're going to get an answer that's in KPA. That's my unknown pressure that we're looking for. Um, but we have to decide, should I put the big number on the top bunk or the small number for volume on the top bunk? So should I put the big number or the small number? Well, we have to look at what we know pressure is doing. Pressure is going to increase. So they, it's almost like volume saying, pressure, pressure, you need to go out with someone who's taller than you. Well, if we're multiplying pressure by a fraction, we need to put right now for this problem the big volume on top and the small volume on bottom. So that way when we get our answer, the pressure is bigger. If we had done it the other way with the small volume and then the big volume, when we multiplied, it would make our pressure smaller, which is not what Boyle's Law says is going to happen in this problem. So I'm going to take my calculator and I'm going to multiply 125 times 3.5. My calculator says that that equals 437, but I have to divide that by the number on the bottom, so divide that by 2. So I got 219 when I round, which is fine, you can round these, 219 kPa, and I'm going to just box that so you know it's the answer. That's my unknown. Is that bigger? Yep. 219 is bigger than 125. And so when the volume went down, my pressure went up. So we are good. Before we learn about Charles' Law, I have to tell you about temperature. So first, what is temperature? These are all things you should put in your notes. You have room for practice problems, but there's room for you to type these bullet points here, and they're all important. Okay, temperature is the measure of average kinetic energy of the molecules. So the faster the particles are moving, the higher their temperature. And remember, we use long arrows coming from the particles to show high temperature. Um, the units we're going to use for temperature is Kelvin. So we have to use Kelvin instead of degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason is because the lowest possible temperature for Kelvin is zero. And we can't have any temperature that's negative when we do these problems. It's super easy, though, to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. All you do is take the degrees Celsius and you add 273, and then you have your temp in Kelvin. To go the other way, if I give you Kelvin and I ask for the answer in Celsius, you just subtract 273. I mentioned that the lowest possible temp for Kelvin is zero, and that's called absolute zero. Absolute zero is at zero Kelvin, so the temperature is zero K, um, and all motion stops. Because remember, kinetic energy is the movement, so if we have zero temperature, that means we have zero movement. Okay, and then the last piece, remember I said kids always forget about what STP is. We talked about how the P part is the pressure at sea level, so 1 ATM, 760 MMHG, all of those rainbow equalities. Um, well, at temperature, if I say STP, I'm talking about 273 Kelvin. That's the temperature at standard temperature and pressure. So these are super easy. Let's practice some of them. We're going to go from Celsius to Kelvin. So I got 37. I have to add 273 to get it into Kelvin. And so that's 310 K as my answer. K, um, Kelvin does not have a degree sign, so it's just capital K. Negative 40 Celsius plus 273 will give me my answer in Kelvin, which is 233K. Let's try it the other way. I gave you Kelvin 294. To get it into Celsius, we subtract 273. So you should get, I believe, 21 degrees Celsius. And the very last one, we got 450 Kelvin. 
minus 273, you should get 177 degrees Celsius. All right, so Charles' law is going to look at temperature and volume. So that means if we're only focusing on temperature and volume, we have to keep pressure and the number of particles constant. They cannot change. Only temperature and volume are changing. And Charles Law says there's a direct relationship. So if the volume goes up, so does the temperature, and vice versa. If the temp goes up, the particles move faster. They need more room if we're going to keep part of, or the number of collisions the same. Um, opposite is true if there's smaller space the particles need to slow down in order to keep the number of collisions the same um, down below there's a link and I'll attach it and put it on canvas I would like you to try to find two or three real-world examples of Charles law so you can write down what the example is and then give me like a one bullet point sentence as to why that fits Charles law all right, I also would like for you to draw a graph in your notes. So on the left-hand column where it says Charles Law graph, hit insert drawing. You can, I just use little arrows for the axes. Temperature is on the X axis, volume is on the Y. So I know that if I increase my temperature as the particles speed up, if I want to keep pressure the same, my volume has to also get bigger. So if my particles are moving more, they also need or if they're moving faster, excuse me, then they need more space, a bigger volume, if we're going to keep the number of collisions the same. So they're both on the upswing. And so if I connect those points, we get a nice straight line. Well, mine's kind of straight, but you can make yours nice and straight on your Google Doc. All right, so we have a practice problem for Charles. I'll last slide for today. So it says a sample of nitrogen occupies a volume of 250 milliliters. So I'm going to make volume blue, and it's at 25 degrees Celsius. Ah! What do I have to do to that? We have to add 273. 25 plus 273. Got to get it into Kelvin. I do it right away so I don't forget. Um, so that will give me 298. Kelvin, what will my volume be? So that's my question mark. If it occupies 95 degrees Celsius. Ah, right there. That's not allowed either. So we're going to do 95 plus 273 will give me my new temperature of 368. All right. Think first. So my temperature is going up. It's going from 298 Kelvin to... So T, I'm going to zoom. That always helps, I think. Well, not that much. T is going to go up um, because we go from 298 Kelvin to 368. What is my volume going to do? Well, Charles Law says it's a direct relationship. So if temp goes up, volume is going to go up. Oops, undo that. So I'm going to record my volume. It's 250 milliliters. Where'd my... There we go. My initial temp is 298K. We're looking for the missing volume. And then my new um, temp, my T2, is the 368 Kelvin. So first step, we look for who doesn't have a date. Well, I see that my temperatures are going to the dance together. So that means my pore volume doesn't have a date. So 250 milliliters does not have a date. We're going to multiply that by all the suggestions from the temperatures. And hopefully, we will get a new volume and because the first volume was in milliliters this volume that we get is also going to be in milliliters all right so we need to decide who goes on top the 298 or the 368 well let's look I want my volume to get bigger so for it to get bigger I have to multiply it by the bigger temperature 368 gets the top bunk and 298 gets the bottom bunk. 
So you're going to multiply, let's see, 250 times 368. That's 92,000, but I'm going to divide that by the number on the bottom, 298. That gives me like 308.7, so let's just call it 309 milliliters. Check your answer. Did my volume get bigger? Because my temperature got bigger. Did my volume, well, 250 to 309, that sounds bigger to me. There we go.